Hi everyone. It's kind of interesting to be both here and there. Uh, welcome to my basement. Uh, we just did some renovations, so it's not too bad. Um, David, did you get a chance to uh, get those PowerPoints and things I like Oh, no, that was me, I'm afraid. I haven't clicked my email. I take responsibility. <laughs> I'm all the responsibility, I'm, I'm afraid. But, uh, uh, oh, look at me. Can you do it? Uh, little Dave, I mean, because I don't know how to take on this. I didn't sure, hear it. yeah. I mean, I mean it's, it's not necessary for me to show. Can you do a uh, show screen? The power. If you do show screen on the little thing, do you know how to do that? Oh, oh no. Don't freeze on your head. Well, how do you do it? Okay. Yeah, I think I think I have the cheap uh, Skype. Uh, I've got a feeling you can do it. Does anybody know how to do it today? Just in time. Yo, PowerPoint is right there. Yeah. Uh, I think everyone in this room is going to be more yeah. help than I can be. Uh, so, on, on, depending on your version of Skype, there should be a, uh, a little logo of a computer screen, uh, which you can click on to, to show, toggle between your webcam and whatever's displaying on your laptop at the time. Have you got one of those? Uh, I don't think so, actually. The no. The difficulty with Skype is that the different versions tend to play around with these things aesthetically quite a lot. Uh, I mean, the menu at the top. Top level menu? Yeah, try menu. Maybe tools or options. Uh, or share screen? Is that yeah. 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 All right, let's see if we can share the screen. I, I think maybe. Okay, I've got a thing up here that says root video. Um, no, it wants me to sign up for this. Okay, it doesn't really matter. Um, we, I think we'll just dispense with that. Uh, what, but what I was going to do was talk about a little bit about the history of ayahuasca. And uh, maybe about 15 minutes, look at some of the highlights certain and basically um, open it up to questions. I mean, we only have half an hour here, right? So, um, you know, so we want to use it. But I wanted to point out a couple of things. I think we all know, everyone in this group knows what ayahuasca is, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. So it, it's basically a... It, it's a combination of two plants, at least two plants, and so it's kind of sophisticated in, as far as indigenous uh, preparations are concerned. It, it, the, the visionary component is, is a, either a Psychotria viridis or Diploteris cabarena, each of which contains dimethyltryptamine. That gives it its visionary qualities, but the vine of Banisteriopsis copy that it's uh, that it's prepared with contains the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, basically carbolinate alkaloids like harmine and harmaline, tetrahydroharmine, that are selective inhibitors of monoamine oxidase A, which is the enzyme in the gut that breaks down DMT, so it protects uh, DMT from that and allows it to become orally active. It renders it orally active. I think I'm not telling anybody in this audience anything that they don't already know. Uh, but just to kind of set the groundwork. So so I wanted to say a little bit about, uh, I, I mean, I guess in general, my talk is kind of uh, aimed toward the idea of the development in the research. There's actually been an explosion uh, in research on ayahuasca um, in the in the latter half of the 20th century, and especially since 2000. I wish I could show you my PowerPoint here. I have a nifty little graph that shows that uh, between 1940 and 1984, there were less than 20 publications, less than 20 citations in Medline, which is kind of the biomedical uh, database 
for the National Library of Medicine, so it's kind of a, you know, a standard for peer-reviewed publications. And between 1984 and 2000, there were about a sing about the equivalent number, so a much shorter period, but the same amount of, of uh, publications. And then between 2000 and 2013, where we are now, there were over 100 publications on ayahuasca in the last decade. Uh, which is pretty impressive. It just shows that it's getting a lot of attention as well it should. Another interesting aspect of this is that uh, of those 100 pu uh, publications, 70% were human studies. Uh, the ones that preceded the earlier publications, there was a lot of focus on the botanical aspects, uh, the indigenous uses, uh, the chemistry, and uh, sorting out the chemistry of uh, ayahuasca, the various plants involved, is a whole, you know, odyssey in itself of kind of chemical discovery. Uh, as some of you already know, most of these alkaloids were harming, harmaline, and tetrahydroharmine were characterized in uh, pigam harmala years before they were found in ayahuasca which is why they're named after Pagan Harmala. And then there was a period in the uh, mid-20th century when various people in various labs were isolating alkaloids from different sources. And often the, the sources were not well established, their identity was not well established uh, botanically, and the chemical methods were somewhat crude too. So you got a situation where harmine, for example, kept being isolated and re-isolated re by different investigators. And some called it telepathine, and some called it benisterine, and there were, there were different names for it. But eventually they got it sorted out, and they, and they realized, no, actually, you know, this so-called new alkaloid from Banisteriopsis copy was found years before in Pagan Parmalin. So it took a while to sort all that out. Um, so that's kind of, you know, I mean, it's both an illustration of the way that science proceeds, which is not always smooth, it, it goes in fits and starts. Uh, I, I think that science is more efficient these days because we have better ways to, to share information. Um, but the odyssey of the, you know, the scientific investigation of ayahuasca stretches Holy back. Holy You have no father. What's that? Carry on, Dan. Okay. Uh, Just carry on. Okay. <laughs> Just a little wrong. I'll do my best. Okay, yes, uh, yes, whatever that gentleman's problem is, I hope it gets resolved. <laughs> what, one of the questions that keeps coming up when we look at the history of ayahuasca is how old is it? What is the real antiquity of ayahuasca? And um, it's a hard question to answer. Um, what we can say is that by the mid-19th century, when it first came to the attention of Western travelers, ethnographers, and so on, it was already widespread in the Amazon. And we know from other sources that um, hallucinogen use, um, the various snuffs, uh, San Pedro cactus, and so on, um, go way back, I mean, well into the you know one to two thousand years before present we can't say that about ayahuasca primarily because there's no archaeological evidence it doesn't it's not well preserved and you know there are ceramics there are ceramics but it's difficult to draw conclusions to say for example that some of these ceramic recoveries from different sites were used to prepare the ayahuasca it seems likely but we can't definitively say. I mean, it doesn't really matter. When, when we know, when we can say for sure that, that ayahuasca first came to Western attention in 1851, when uh, the English botanist Richard Spruce made his collections. And uh, he didn't, uh, you know, he reported on the use of ayahuasca by various tribes 
didn't really publish on that until 1908, when he included his observations in the A.R. Wallace's book, Notes of a Botanist on the Amazon and Andes. So that's really when the topic of ayahuasca emerged as uh, kind of a subject for scientific investigation, and not much before that. Uh, and then the chemists got busy, the chemists and the pharmacologists. So a chemist named Goebel isolated harmine and harmaline from the gallon harmaline, or Syrian rue, in 1847. And harmine was, was uh, isolated from the same source shortly after that. And the first pharmacological investigation of the effects of any of these compounds was uh, Tappaner, an investigator uh, called Tappaner, who evaluated the effects of harming in lab animals in 1895. And then looking at this era of sort of botanical and chemical investigation, basically from the 1900s to the 1950s was the era where chemists began to uh, get into the act and characterize the, the chemistry. Uh, one of the uh, sort of scandalous, or at least scientifically um, unfortunate, missteps in the investigation of ayahuasca was when the uh, French anthropologist Reinberg misidentified Yahe as Prestonia Amazonica, which is completely uh, an incorrect identification. It took that was 1921. It took 30 years to straighten that out. And even now, Prestonia Amazonica sometimes comes up in the literature. Um, ironically, the investigators that worked out the, the chemistry, the, the correct taxonomy of Banisteriopsis, were not botanists, but chemists. Uh, a team called Chen and Chen who in 1939 were the first people to clarify the chemistry of uh, Banisteriopsis based on botanical, correctly vouchered botanical specimens. That, that's the problem, and that's a problem that, it, that plagues natural products chemistry in general, is not to work from correctly identified material. And so, even though that seems like what you might call a no-brainer, they were the first to do it. So that was a, 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 uh, a landmark uh, in, the, just in the sort of investigation of ayahuasca. And 1957 was another big year for ayahuasca studies. Schultes published the uh, paper, The Identity of the Malpigiaceous Narcotics of South America in Harvard Botanical Museum Leaf in that year which was kind of the definitive uh, exposition of what was known at the time. Um, Stephen Zara, another name that might be known to you in 1957, the first person to demonstrate the hallucinogenic activity of dimethyltryptamine, uh, and also established that it, was, that it lacked oral activity. Interestingly enough, Stephen Zara eventually became, decades after these experiments, on himself. He became the head of NIDA, uh, National Institute on Drug Abuse here in America. Um, some of us wish that he was still the head of NIDA. Uh, we might be able to move some of this research forward uh, a little. He is still around and still uh, very much involved in, in this stuff. Um, in 1958, the activity of the beta carbolines as reversible MAO inhibitors was discovered um, by a group at NIH. And in 1963, William Burroughs published the Yahe Ladders, which was a result of his own uh, sort of freelance investigations of ayahuasca when he looked to search, when he went to Columbia to find ayahuasca in the early 50s. So let's see, uh, what else? Uh, in 1967, the Ethnopharmacologic Search for Psychoactive Drugs, a landmark publication was published in San Francisco. Um, what else? Uh, well, I guess one of the, one of the main um, sort of pivotal points that kind of triggered the 
scientific investigation was the Waska project, which we initiated in 1993 at the invitation of the uh, UDV, the Lumiao de Vegetal. They invited a group of international researchers to initiate a biomedical investigation of ayahuasca, which we we did, and that was that was kind of a point where the growth in publications uh, became exponential. And since then, it's just continued. But it's it's encouraging that in the last decade, much of the research that's going on is is more related to clinical investigations and more, more, more human studies. So, you know, there's a lot to learn, but there is progress being made here. And uh, that's about, you know, that's my summary. And I wonder if maybe we should go to questions. I'm not sure what our time frame is here. Uh, thank you. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that sounds good. Echo. Does that sound good? Okay. I think we've got a bit of feedback of uh, that. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you fine. Uh, but, okay, so we have about, uh, I'd say about uh, 12 minutes or something. I would, yeah, if you'd like to do questions, that'd be fantastic. Uh, if I can just take the prerogative, because people can start taking their hands up. Uh, I would just, can you tell us a little bit about this paper that's just now come out with yourself and Edie Fritzka and uh, Louis Luna about DMT. Right, well, I can't tell you as much about it as I, as I wish I could. In fact, I probably shouldn't even be you on know, that paper. I was, I was invited to be on it. But I think, I think it's an interesting, um, in some ways, possibly a very significant paper. It's not experimental, but one of the one of the things that has, you know, that puzzles neuroscience is what does this inductive snitch in do? Why is it there? What is, what is the physiological function of DMT? And yeah, Nicholas Cozini and, and other investigators have found that it's a sigma one receptor agonist. Uh, and I think the paper is. Are you, are you hearing me? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I think the paper is interesting just because it points to some some uh, other avenues to explore. Uh, you know, one of the suspicions that uh, you know, one of the suggestions is that in in some ways these these compounds may be immune system modulators, and I think there's emerging evidence that that may be true, and, and that's possibly very important if we look for mechanistic basis of shamanic healing and, and these sorts of related things. So I think the paper is uh, a, uh, you know, it, it's an interesting contribution. It, I wish I, I wish you, I knew you were going to pop that I'm up. Sorry, I, 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 <laughs> or I would have reviewed it more recently. but. But yeah, I mean, I mean, there's a lot of people working on this right now, and, and one of the, I mean, it's interesting that ayahuasca is suddenly attracting all this attention, and uh, of the various uh, psychedelics that are being used in clinical studies, this one is the more, most difficult, because they're, you know, even though it is getting out, there are a lot of human studies, but there's no, you know, it's not a single substance, and so, and it's derived from a plant, so it's hard to get approval from regulatory agencies like the FDA and uh, to carry out studies of this kind on, on a plant-based preparation. And so, you know, in some ways, it doesn't really fit into the usual uh, model of a, a placebo-controlled random uh, clinical study. It, it doesn't work that way. One of the things we've discussed in that context is, well, you know, do we necessarily need to work within the, the structure of FDA and similar agencies? Much of this work would be done in Peru, for example, um, where 
you know, it's much more easy. Or uh, Jordi Riva in Spain has demonstrated that you can work out this context. So that's the thing, how, how to move the science ahead and, and not abandon uh, scientific rigor. Um, yeah. Uh, so, Sultasi. Okay. Uh, hi, Dennis. Um, I would like to ask you about the harmony in kind of metabolism. Is there anything known about people which are kind of non-responders to ayahuasca, which means they vomit more, they, they, their organism can't cope with it? As far as I know from Jay's Telloway studies, there's a very individual pattern in the metabolism of uh, harmony. So are there people out there, and you know about, uh, which can't cope with ayahuasca from a physiological point? Well, yes, yes, there are. Uh, I mean, this this is also complex, but you know, I, I know from personal experience, um, I I have uh, been with people who have apparently are immune to ayahuasca. And they can take many cups of it, and they get very very little effect. Uh, other people can take a, a, a tiny fraction, much less than you would you would normally take, and they have a profound effect. What goes into this is is hard to say, but I do think, I mean, the pharmacokinetic studies that uh, all the way they have about it, there's have done shown that you know probably some people have just just inherently much higher levels of monoamine so that would tend to protect them from. Ayahuasca, if, if you know from DMT, if if it's not fully inactivated, uh, but you know, if, I mean, this is why we need to do some more systematic studies because it, it's common enough that a, a, a single person will have a profound reaction on on one occasion, and on another occasion will have almost no reaction, and it's the same person, and it's the same preparation. So, uh, you know, there is great variation, but what are the variables that determine this? Uh, we haven't really worked it out. It, it, everybody is a farm, it's a biochemical individual when it comes down to your, you know, your genetic complement of these various enzymes that uh, metabolizing. I have another question here from the floor. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering if you feel about like the uh, potential use of harmony for treatment of people on the autism spectrum. Does that come to mind at all? I'm not hearing that to you. Sorry. To repeat it. There, there's a net or something. Hi, sorry. Um, I was just wondering if you um, thought anything about the potential use of harmony to treat uh, people on the autistic spectrum. Uh, Harmony uh, and preparations. I, I have thought about it. I, I don't. I think that uh, MDMA actually is showing more promise potentially for the treatment of autism than than ayahuasca. I don't know that anyone has really uh, investigated ayahuasca. It's possible, but it seems that MDMA would be more appropriate. I believe Julie Holland, who may be at that conference, I'm not sure, has done some investigation of it. No? Okay. Um, are you aware of her work on this? No. No. She reported on it on the, at the MAPS conference in Oakland recently. And because, uh, if I understand it correctly, and I'm certainly no psychiatrist or psychologist, but you know, the problem that people with autism have is, is connection, is empathy, or apparent lack of empathy. So MDMA seems like a, a good solution to try to, to deal with that. Ayahuasca too, but it's less less appropriate. All the uh, all the other sensory stuff might be a distraction in some ways. You know, I mean, we we can't we haven't really begun to explore what what the spectrums of uh, potential therapeutic applications for ayahuasca are. See, it seems clear that it should be one. Uh, PTSD is another promising area. Autism, it just it hasn't been looked at. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Thank you. I think we've got the time for one last question, Danny. Uh, hello. 
Um, I mean, um, I think it might be an answer to the $64 million question, in fact. Um, there's um, like linguistic studies that make it fairly clear that ayahuasca, the vine, on its own, without the tuna, was used and was, it looks like it was the original use, and they're still trying to using just, just the vine on its own. Mm -hmm. and, That's true. And shakuna also has a medicinal use in the Amazon without the uh, without the vine. It's, it's used to make it idols in certain tribes. Uh -huh. So it's the kind of thing that would probably have been kicking around a medicine man's, uh, you know, in his medicine bag anyway. And he would have been using quite a lot of it for. There's plenty of opportunities for him uh -huh. to have been using the vine, using a teammate of the vine, and just to have maybe to put some idols in, or maybe to uh, some other way to. Uh, to discover the, the, the fantastic alchemy, which isn't to mean that, uh, isn't to say that ayahuasca is not full of mysteries, but I don't think this one's really a mystery anymore. Well, I, yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I think, I think that that's a reasonable speculation. The answer is nobody really knows, but, but we do know, as the gentleman said, we know that there are tribes that use ayahuasca without any admixtures, and and psychotry is used, uh, as he said, to make eye drops sometimes. It's you've got other medicinal use. And I've seen films on YouTube, and I'm not sure how credible these are, that, that jaguars, for example, have an attraction to Bamsteriopsis that is, you know, to them it's like catnip. And, and I don't know whether those are fake, or, but they certainly seem to enjoy rolling around in... in so. You know, it won't be the first time that, uh, you know, shamans have learned about medicinal uses of plants by watching animals. Uh, the, other, the other connection is various of these snuffs, which we do know are ancient. And, you know, I, I, think, I think what we have to remember is that shamans are experimentalists, essentially, and they have these medicines, and they play around with them, just like we do. And it's not unreasonable to think that accidentally this combination could be brought about. That if you're, you know, making a medicinal preparation for bamsteriopsis, and you know, you happen to add in an extract of psychotria just to see what happens, you only have to do it once, and then, you know, and then the hundredth monkey problem will, that you know, phenomenon will take care of it. That that knowledge will spread very quickly. And I think that's probably what happened. You know, beta carbolines and tryptamines are not that rare in nature. So the idea that you would, you know, just essentially through, you know, trial and error would stumble on this combination, that's not, uh, not an unreasonable supposition. But do we have it nailed down? Can we say, you know, uh, <laughs> can we say definitively how that was brought, brought about? I don't know. You know, I mean, the UDV has their story. It was King Solomon, right, who uh, took a vacation and came over and taught the Inca kings how to do it. Um, you know, well, I think that's kind of unlikely. Yeah. The shamans will say, well, the plants told us. Isn't it obvious the plants told us? Maybe so. And maybe there's something to that. And organoleptic qualities of plants, uh, you know, is a factor. And, I do think that indigenous people who are who work closely with these plant medicines, they they appreciate some of their sensory qualities that may not be obvious to us, and so intuitively, you know, uh, they might arrive at these combinations. Like a good chef uh, might come up with a good combination. It's very much the same kind of thing. So again, the answer is the answer is I don't know, but we're free to speculate. Uh, thank you for speculating with us, uh, Dennis. I'm afraid we've we've run out of time. Uh, thank you very much for joining us and putting up with the technical difficulties.